Hi, my name is Zach Snyders and welcome to the Information Security Awareness course. This course is designed to lay the foundation and create an awareness for information security. The course is designed in such a way to cater for a wide audience. It's a beginner's course, but it's also a refresher course for more experienced users. There are so many people that has no protection and have taken no precaution to protect themselves. We are introducing the minimum requirements for various layers of protection. Over the past few years, I implemented many information security projects at companies. During these implementations, I realized just how bad the awareness is out there. From youngsters joining small business to very senior people that's been with firms for a long time. People that grew with the companies. They simply have no idea about the risk exposure they face on a daily basis. In some cases it was an absolute miracle that serious information breaches did not occur. They were so lucky. Legislation related to personal information indicates that each company must ensure that a data breach does not occur. That is a tall order, but we will get there. I don't want to scare you on day one, which is why we are going to tackle this beast one step at a time. The list of things that can go wrong with passwords and logins is long. As an individual, Hackers will normally not look at you with the same amount of interest as, for example, if you were a bank executive, right? Wrong. Hackers target everybody. Hi again, this is Zuck. I trust you have enjoyed the previous lecture that gave you a very brief introduction to passwords. All right, let us tackle this beast. If you thought that passwords are on the way out, think again. The pain of passwords will be with us for a while still. The emphasis on passwords is in fact increasing. Nobody likes passwords, and there have been many attempts to replace passwords with fingerprints and facial recognition but although there's been some success but for now please pay attention passwords are your only real protection let us start today's lecture some of us have a safe in our house some of us even have several some of us have a safe, a burglar alarm, and maybe armed response. You get some with a ski, some are electronic, some are both. You even get some with fingerprint or biometric scanners. And yes, if you really want to get into it, like in the movies, you can also get safes with iris scanning safes. But why? Isn't this a bit extreme? Why do we do it? Obviously to store important documents, maybe a firearm, jewelry. But generally, the stuff that we want to protect at all costs. Now if we go to such extremes to protect our personal belongings, how is it then that we don't have the same mindset when it comes to our online protection. We spend thousands on physical protection, but we allow access to our online personal stuff. And sometimes there's even more critical information online that can be more damaging to us than what is in the safe. Let me explain. We store important information on the internet, such as financial and personal stuff, on places like Facebook, banking apps, 
and many others. This is normal practice on the internet and there's nothing wrong with that in principle. However, the passwords and login credentials that we need to access these sites are often not secure enough to protect us. We sometimes make it so easy for our friendly neighborhood hacker. And trust me, many of us do. Let me give you some examples. If you don't have a social media account, you are certainly among the very few. On social media, there are places in your settings, on your profile, where you enter information like employment information, your address, telephone number, work history, etc. Wonderful information that is excellent to use for any potential malicious person. Maybe a person that wants to call you for some more information. With the information that is available of a person on social media, add to that your ID and telephone number and identity theft becomes possible. That is why it is so important that you protect your password system. In most cases, that is all that stands between you and losing everything. Now, I will stress this several times during the lecture. It is one of the most important things that you can do is to protect the passwords that you use for your various accounts. Many people use the same password or a variation of it for their, all their accounts. This is a bad idea. Think about it. If you use the same password for everything and somebody actually gets hold of it, then they own you. Let's put some basic principles in place as a start. Never ever use the same password for everything. And please don't think that by adding a single digit, like a one or a hash, after the same password makes it safe. Don't ever store your password on your computer. There are exceptions, but we will get to it. Methods to actually do it safely. It may be a pain to type it every time, but think about it. Your laptop is in your house and there's a burglary. The person manages to get into your notebook. All of a sudden, your whole life is out there and compromised. Some people store their passwords on the sticky note next to that same computer. Now that is a good idea. Please, please. Don't have a file on your computer with the name passwords or credentials and inside this document each and every system account with all your passwords. You might as well print it out and put it in your drawer where anybody and everybody can get it. And you will be sorry, trust me, when you least expect it. Now let's get back to storing your password on your computer. Nearly everyone is guilty of storing their passwords on their computers. Because it's so easy. Every time you register online on a site, or online application, or online service, you are required to register, or if it's an existing account, sign in. Your computer normally then gives you the option to save the password. And for many, if not most people, this is an automatic yes. And convenience is the motivator here. And of course, you trust your computer. The media, application vendors, everybody says you can trust your operating system. They will keep your password safe. 
Your provider may even claim that it's got such excellent encryption and wonderful methods of keeping your password safe. I am not knocking anyone or any provider, but I'll give you the facts. You decide. Chrome saves your password in your Google account. Once logged into your account, all your passwords are visible. This means that if your account is hacked, the hacker has access to all other accounts. Firefox and Safari save your passwords in your browser settings under the security tab. And if you have access to the device, you can open all the passwords without any login step. Internet Explorer saves your passwords in your browser and does not show your saved passwords. However, there is an easy to find software tool that can expose these passwords. So with this in mind, are your passwords really safe? Firefox, Safari and Internet Explorer offers no protection if a hacker gets hold of your physical device. Don't trust it. Rather retype your password every time and be safe. I'll give you some more examples just to make you think. Think about sites like Amazon, online banking, job seeking sites. On most of these sites, you enter personal and financial information when creating your profile. This is of course needed to transact with these companies and all similar sites, and there's nothing wrong with it. This is normal online e-commerce process. These sites and companies have lots of security and they are very secure. No problem here. But think about reality. Once again, it is only a password that prevents a stranger or hacker to get into those sites. Compromising your credit rating. Stealing your money. The bottom line. Don't auto-save your passwords. Don't store passwords anywhere. I trust that you realize the importance of password health. Now, let me help you with methods of creating a strong password without making your life a misery. Now we have already established that if you use common passwords that are easy to guess or you write them down, then you are operating on luck. And like any luck, one day this will run out. Then you could lose your data, your identity, your bank balance. And remember, the hackers are not targeting you specifically. Think about a fishing boat that catches fish with large nets. They put the nets into the sea and drag them. They have no idea what they're actually going to catch that day. Don't be one of the fish. Don't let your guard down. There's only one place that cannot be hacked, and that's your head. Yeah, yeah, big deal. I can almost hear you say it. It's impossible to remember many passwords, and I agree with you. As an exercise, think about and count how many accounts you have that require a username and password probably going to take a while just thinking about it and writing them down. Like I said, a good exercise is to put together a file with all accounts, system, usernames and passwords, as if you have to prepare for when you are no longer there. You will be a shock. Don't keep it around though. 
If you don't have a safe, destroy it. I'm now going to give you a few of the most important must do and must not do guidelines for password creation and password management. I will also provide you with a more detailed list of them in the accompanying downloadable PDF file. Download it, use it, be safe. First, the must do. When using your own password method, always use passwords of at least 12 characters. Always have a mix of alpha characters, numeric characters and special characters. Always create unique passwords. Never ever use the same password or variations of the same password for multiple accounts. Then remember, as a test, after you've created your unique password or that you believe is a unique password, do a search on the internet on your chosen password. You may find that your chosen password is already known out there and may be even listed in the so-called password dictionaries. Now for those who don't know, password dictionaries are one of the many resources used by hackers and phishing experts. I will always strongly recommend using a password manager. If you don't know what a password manager is, it is an application that manages all your passwords for all applications or services. Using a password manager is probably the best solution for most people. However, when selecting a password manager, choose wisely. Don't by default go for the free version or the cheapest version. Choose a password manager based on features and functionality. Do your homework and also follow the guidelines I provide. In any system or application, gives you the option to use two-factor authentication. Please accept this. It adds an extra layer of security and will soon be the industry standard. It makes your online security that much safer. Never use sequential and repetitive characters and avoid context-specific password. An example is, don't include the name of the site in your password. Never use clever but commonly used passwords. The word password with the A replaced by an AND or the O with a zero. There are so many people using this, it's not even funny. Don't. Remember that even when using two-factor or multi-factor security, you still have to choose an easy to remember but a hard to guess password. Never reuse passwords. If any of the system or services that you have signed on to or that you use on the internet require you to change your password, please do not change it to something similar or try and fool the system by adding a digit. Most systems will not allow it, but even if it does, don't. Never use adjacent keyboard strings, not even in reverse. Everybody knows about it. QWERTY1234 is not secure. Please, hackers love them. 
If you choose to use and create your own password, use a passphrase. This is much more difficult to guess. But please don't use a common phrase as I have a nice house. Use a phrase of at least six words that would make sense to you only. Let's try an example like, I earned $300 when I started working in Rome. The password you can build from this, as example, first from left to right, using the first digit of each word, then starting again from right to left, using the first digit of every word. That makes for a very strong password. Now think about it. If you still add a password manager to this and then use this password that you've just uh, created as in my example and use that for your master password, imagine how safe you will be then. Use your own example though. Don't copy mine. Let me give you a few examples of good password managers. You have managers like Dashlane, Sticky Password, Roboform, Avast. There are many others. Please note, I do not favor or promote any of them, nor is the order of any significance. I'm only providing these examples to get you started in your search. And once again, as I said previously, choose wisely. Not all password managers are created equally. Most will have the basic security features needed for proper password management, such as weak password flagging, password generator, and two-factor or even multi-factor authentication. There are other critical features to look for. Most password managers comes with a secure password generator, but just double check this. Automated password updates, good feature. This is where your password manager will update your password if a site has been hacked. Also check for password autofill features, whereby the password manager will manage all your passwords for you in application in a similar fashion than saved passwords of your operating system, except much more secure. Another important feature is a digital wallet. This is used specifically to secure and store your credit card numbers and other payment details. Emergency third party access. This is where your password manager allows you to designate emergency contexts, all good features. This concludes our lecture on passwords. I trust you found this insightful and that this has given you enough of a background to fully understand the importance of passwords. Feel free to drop me an email if you have any concerns or you need assistance. Hi, good day and welcome. This is Zuck. I trust you have enjoyed the lecture on passwords. Now backups are even a bigger beast. I want to spend enough time with you to ensure that you not only understand the importance, but also how to make backups. Now immediately you may think, what is this guy on about? Backups is simple, it's easy, and yes it is. But there are different backups for different people, for different reason. Let's tame this beast. 
The interesting fact is that backups are not so common amongst individuals and small business. And that's very scary. The need for a backup solution cannot be stated enough. Don't be like this guy. In this lecture, I'm not going to aim a shotgun at you and overwhelm you. I will discuss the basics and empower you with just enough to be safe. If you want to take a really deep dive into backup, there will be a separate course for that. My aim today is to help you recover from a disaster without breaking the bank. The solutions I will discuss today should also be adequate for a small business. On your laptop or desktop, you have many files. These could be documents, photos, music, and other important documents. First, a few questions just to make you think. Have you ever lost data? Have you ever accidentally deleted files from your computer? Or has your hard disk ever become totally corrupted? Here's another one. Did you ever get to your desk or office or your home, opened up your laptop and it was just dead? That is the moment when a wave of mixed feelings and emotions washes over you. For some of us, like a tidal wave. Like a combination of almost sick nausea, a helpless feeling. Now when that happens and you know you don't have a backup, or you know your backup is not a recent one, then in addition to all of those emotions, there's probably another one. Anger. And all of that can be avoided. Well, partially. You still have to restore, but at least you can restore if you have a backup. Let's get back to the basics. Chance to make a backup that are simple and straightforward. But for many of us, it is not so straightforward. We're first going to look at some conventional manual backup methods. And remember, any backup is better than no backup, as long as you are able to recover. In its simplest form, you can copy files or folders to a DVD or USB drive. And yes, lots of people still use CDs and DVDs. More popular are external hard drives that are these days big enough to back up some or all of your hard disk and files. There are also many cloud-hosted solutions. Please don't worry if you don't know what it is. We will discuss this in detail. Now once again, it does not matter which method you choose and we will discuss a number of them. The important thing is you must have at least three backups. Now by three backups I mean three physical instances of backups and please not on the same media. And there are many people that make their backups on the same laptop or desktop then they are backing up and they sleep at night. Wow! Using such manual methods as I have described is of course a bit of a pain to manage. Not many individuals have the discipline to actually do that on a daily, weekly and monthly basis. When doing manual backups, the ideal type of backup that you should have is firstly a monthly backup, that's a full backup of everything, and I mean everything. You must have a weekly backup of all the changes during that week, at the very least, and a daily incremental. 
We will also discuss an image backup a little later. Now maintaining that sort of discipline will ensure that you never lose more than a day and a daily incremental normally takes a few minutes so it won't waste your time. Once again, there's only a very few disciplined people that will manage to maintain this. We all need some help and that is where backup software really comes into play. There are many different types of backup software. I will discuss a few of them to get you started. There are free ones and a few not so free ones. Now if you are one of those people that has everything in your closet neatly organized, then you won't have a problem and organizing your files and folders on your hard drive will come naturally. However, if you can't even keep your shirts and socks separate, then listen carefully and check the examples. A golden rule is to identify an approach that is sensible, achieve what is needed and that you can stick to. To enable a successful backup approach and backup strategy, you need to order and classify your files and your data. Now your operating system normally goes a long way to do this for you. And in your existing file structure, you will most probably find, at the very least, existing folders or groups that will be under File Explorer and Windows and Finder on Mac. On Windows, pre-existing groups will be documents, downloads, music, pictures, videos, etc. The documents or my documents in Windows is normally the default folder where most of the documents created by Windows are stored. But after a few months, this could be a bit of a mess. Applications normally create their own folders, but you need to create your own folders under my document structures as you need them. Research has indicated that any habit becomes a discipline after three weeks. So go for it. Decide on something, stick to it. After you've created your file structures as you need them, move all files to their new homes and make sure you stick to that process. After that, Backup and recovery will become a breeze. Look at the example that I have provided you, whereby you can use this model to classify your data. This is just an example to get you started, but you should get the approach, you should get what I'm trying to get, uh, bring across. Having a structured file and folder classification order will help you in many ways. It will not only provide the necessary assistance when you need to find files or search for files, helping indexing, it will also help you when starting to do advanced cloud backups, whereby cloud backups needs to be optimized as far as possible to preserve disk space, bandwidth and cost. For your business folders, a good idea is call it my business. Example of subfolders could be marketing, presentations, financials, etc. However, if you have multiple clients, I recommend that you give each client its own top level folder and have individual project folders underneath that. Then you could Similar to your normal Windows folder, you can have each client have his own document folders and uh, pictures, etc. under them. I trust this has given you a good background, not only on the importance of backups, but how to prepare for and create a solid foundation for backups. In the next lecture, 
we will discuss a number of backup options, pros and cons of each, and I will show you an example of actually performing a backup as a tutorial. After this tutorial, you should be able to use this as a guide and apply that with most backup software. The principle of most backup software is similar. There will always be more detailed user guides that's provided with the software as well as on their website. This then concludes part one of backups. See you in the next lecture. Hi, good day. This is Zuck again. I trust you have enjoyed the previous lecture on backups. Let us briefly recap. We have discussed passwords and we have identified some good password principles. And have you implemented a strong process yet? I hope so. Leave a comment or email me and let me know. You will remember that we said that good password habits are your only real protection. So, if your passwords is then your preventative protection, preventing access to the nasties out there, then we must then see your backups as your reactive protection, helping to fix things after they have gone wrong. As I mentioned previously, there are people out there that are very disciplined. So, have you decided on an approach for your future file structures? It is very important that you do, and that you do get it in place before you really start making backups. As I said, this is especially true for online backups, but if you're not going to get into online backups right away, it's okay, take your time, but get a good structure implemented and maintain it. I strongly advise following the process, organize your drive and do your backups. I have mentioned that there is a number of software packages available that can assist you with your backups and storage of files as is applicable in your specific situation. Let us look at a few options. If you are a photography enthusiast, you may have thousands of pictures or images and photos. A good quality photo can be a few megs of space and your hard drive can very quickly run out of space. So let us then look at the storing of photographs as a first example. There are some excellent online photo storage services. Please note however, if you do not have a good, reliable, fast and uncapped internet service, don't even consider online solutions it would be way cheaper to look at local storage. Let me give you a few examples of online storage. 
Some of the most popular software and services are iDrive, iCloud, Dropbox, pCloud, Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, and Flickr. There are many others. These are examples. Please note that I don't specifically recommend any specific product. I provide the names of randomly selected services to get you started, except those I use as a personal individual. All of these services have a free option that will provide you with a number of gigabytes of storage for free. Should you require more storage than they offer for free, they are easy to upgrade and they have plans to suit your specific requirements. You can obviously subscribe to many of these services to get your online storage for free. Please don't. Then you will be back where you started with a mess and probably even a bigger mess. Not knowing what is where on which cloud drive or service. This makes any form of a sensible backup automated process an absolute nightmare. Have a look at the websites of all of these service providers and their offerings and check out the pros and cons and pricing of each. I provide a downloadable PDF file for you where I include a few names and some notes to get you started. As I mentioned just now, I'm sharing the names of the systems I use an as an individual. I use iDrive for disk, files and photo backup to the cloud. Note that it can become pricey depending on your volume of data. For local and image backups, I use a combination of Acronis TrueImage and AOMe Backupper. All three of these products have a limited free version. Most other software packages has as well. Test them, analyze your individual requirements, and then before you upgrade to a long-term paid plan, make sure of the cost involved that you make the right choice for you. Some of the cloud backup options out there are more suited to business and business files, not photos. Some of these services and software, as you will also see in the PDF file, are suitable for both photos and files and provide an easy to use interface. It would be wise to choose an application that is suitable for both local backups as well as cloud backup. This is especially important when you want to start with local backups and then at a later stage start doing cloud backups as part of your backup strategy. Develop your own backup strategy for yourself and your own situation. Base it on the recommendations that I provide you with. You should always have several local copies of all your important data. Then you should have some off-sites copies. Don't let this happen to you. Look at this poor guy. Make your backups. The approach I recommend is that you do not need to back up all the purchased software packages that you install on your computer or that is included in your operating system. This can easily be reinstalled providing you have the original disks or downloads. Keep your original software disks and downloads in a safe place. Make sure that you always keep a copy of your license codes and user credentials to be able to reinstall if needed. Also keep another copy of your license codes at a different premise if possible. To safeguard and protect your software and data in case of a hard disk crash, I recommend that you do an image backup at least once a month. If you do not yet know what an image backup is, 
No problem. We will discuss that shortly. The diagram that I provide you as an example is a typical good practice backup approach whereby you do a weekly full backup, a daily incremental and a monthly image backup. Let us discuss the different backup types just for clarity and to avoid anyone getting behind and not understanding the terminology that we use. We will start with local backups. Now this is a backup that you will make of the files or folders on your hard disk to a local drive. Now this local drive can be any destination drive connected to or inside your computer. Please don't select a non-removable drive inside your computer for backup. Make your backup to an external USB or external hard drive. A backup is not simply a copy. And you should always use appropriate backup software for this task. That you can maintain a backup history. Let's look at backup for the cloud. Now for those of you not familiar with cloud computing and cloud backup, you should see cloud backup in principle similar to a local backup. The only difference is that the destination drive is sitting in the cloud somewhere. Now in the cloud in this instance meaning your backup will reside on a file server somewhere with a service provider. Constraints here you must always be aware of is bandwidth and ensure you make the correct and appropriate backup software selection. Now if you make use of a backup service, a backup service is typically cloud backup software with its own proprietary cloud storage. The process is slightly different and the software will automatically make the backup to their own cloud storage facility. Let's look at image-based backups. Uh, image-based backups are the process whereby your entire disk is backed up in one single run. This means the backup includes the operating system, all your software, all your files, basically everything in a single pass. The only disadvantage of an image backup is that it takes a long time to backup and that is why it's not always a backup of choice. However, it's a crucial backup to have. Please do it at least monthly. Major advantage of an image backup is the fact that you can restore your computer to the exact state as it was before a crash. An advanced option, alternative option of backup, other than an external hard drive, is network attached storage, or in short, NAS. For your purposes in this awareness course, you must see NAS as a large external hard disk drive that is connected to your computer network and is always on. We are not going to cover all the various definitions, types and applications of NAS in this course. It's a more advanced topic. But for use at home and in a small business, you can purchase a NAS device from various dealers. Ask for a personal cloud device and they will know exactly what you are after. It's normally large enough to store the data, photos and disk images of several computers. You can use it as a regular desktop drive. It is however designed to be left on and running 24-7. Let's look at some backup software. 
we need to back up our important files in three places. Just remember again your live copy that is the data on your internal hard drive is not one of the copies. The first backup you must make is a full backup of all your important files. Remember that we discussed the classification of files earlier. In your backup software package you will typically select the folders of the files you plan to backup for your full backup. Now full backups are normally done once a week and part of your overall backup plan. Now a week in the life of IT is of course a very long time and if something goes wrong a lot of data is going to be lost. That's why we do additional other backups. For this example we call it an incremental backup. Incremental backups backs up the data that has changed since the last backup. Your third backup will be a full system image backup. Now this kind of backup is ideally done once a month and stored on an external drive that can be stored safely. I recommend that you have more than one copy and it is also a good idea to verify the image backup before storing it in a safe place. This process of verification is an option that is included or part of your backup software. When doing any of these backups, the destination will be an external or NAS drive. As mentioned previously, if you have a cloud destination that is accessible by a drive letter, you can use the cloud drive as a destination as well. You cannot do this for an image backup. An image backup has to be written to a connected external drive of the same size or bigger. The same as your internal drive that you are making the image of. This concludes part 2 of backups. Download the PDF. It contains additional help some tips and a step-by-step -step tutorial. I trust you have enjoyed this lecture. Leave a comment or drop me a mail. Tell me about your backups. I would love to hear from you. See you in the next lecture when we talk about email. The open door to many attacks unless we close it. And we will close it. Enjoy. Good day, this is Zuck. Welcome to this very important lecture about email security, email practices and how to protect ourselves against phishing and other threats lurking, waiting for that moment when we are not alert, waiting to strike. Most computer users make use of email for daily communication as an individual or working for a company you use email you get your invoices your utility bills letters of complaints all by email on your computer on your mobile device wherever but it's still email you also get the hacking attempts the spam and the phishing all by email. Let us get some of the background theory out the way. Now, the most popular email protocols in use today is POP, or POP3 rather, IMAP, and Microsoft Exchange. There are some others, but they are, those are the most important and predominant ones. With this lecture, however, I'm not going to include exchange. Exchange is normally used by corporations, 
and I am just focusing on POP3 and IMAP. I will briefly explain the difference between the two. For most of us, all we need to know is that POP3 will actually download the email from your mail server to your device or computer. For IMAP, we need a connection to the internet. There are many free and paid email service providers. Gmail, probably one of the most popular email providers out there. We also have Outlook, Yahoo Mail, in the Apple space, iCloud. There are many, many more out there. All free email providers have limits. An example is Gmail with a 15 gigabyte mailbox limit. Now if you want to go to the next level with your email and have full control over your own email, then you need to look at your own hosting company. You would then typically set up a hosting package with a service provider and once again there are many out there. You choose your own domain name which will then become your email address. Example, joe at whatever domain name you choose, dot com or dot other extensions. There are a variety. Now for your own domain and self-managed email, prices vary from very cheap to quite expensive. Do your research and choose what will work for you. Now I'm not going to spend too much time on the various service providers. For a free email service, I would choose from the top three vendors. For a paid service with your own domain, you will have to do a bit of your own homework. But HostGator, Network Solutions or GoDaddy is a good start. To search for comprehensive lists for paid service providers, enter best email hosting services in your search engine and for free email providers type best free email providers in your search engine and you will get a load. For the rest of this lecture I'm going to assume that you have an email address and email box regardless of whether that is Gmail or Outlook. Whatever method you use to send and receive emails, we will now focus on protecting you, your email, your computer and your identity. Let us start with some spam. Now everybody must have heard about the term spam. Most people think that it is simply stupid, it's annoying and you must try and get rid of it. And yes, mostly it is just a nuisance, but spam today is not only a nuisance, it can be a serious threat. Did you know that in more than 90% of instances, spam is simply unsolicited email? sent to you in bulk through an automatic process from an email list. A list that the spammer probably purchased. So they have no idea who you are. They hope you respond, click a link or unsubscribe. Or respond by purchasing something. There is a small percentage of spam however that is not so innocent. And you must be very careful when you deal with spam. Even if you are interested in the product they are trying to sell you, be careful to check that any URL or links are legit. You do that by letting your mouse hover over the link and on the bottom left of your screen you will see the actual value of that URL or link. Then. Do a search in your search engine for that URL. You will then see if it's legit or something else. However, be very careful with the actual spelling of that company name. Sometimes a site can appear 100% legit. 
the correct appearance, the correct logos, but just a single digit that is different that makes the URL unique and not the actual company you think it represents. Never reply to a spam email. Just delete it. Let's talk about phishing. In an old movie from 1986, The Fly, there's a quote, Be afraid. Be very afraid. In the world of phishing, you should say to yourself often, be alert, be very alert. The bottom line is if you are not alert, phishing will get you. Phishing is one of the most effective ways for hackers and criminals to get into your machine and into your life. In most cases, a phishing email is an email that contains some sort of advertisement or messages or interesting lines but with malicious links or attachments and the sender hopes that you are not alert and if you click on a link or open the attachment without checking it out first oh, oh with a single click you can literally lose your identity or your bank account and in case you ask how is this different from spam? Phishing is always malicious. Now the entry points for phishing is normally telephone calls, messaging like SMS or WhatsApp, and mostly emails. More than 60% of phishing attempts are via email. So, be alert, be aware, ultimately you are the best protection for your environment regardless of how effective the security systems or antivirus you have, you are still the best single protection. Let's look at telephone calls. More and more on a daily basis, users are bombarded by various telephone calls from unknown individuals and call centers. Many such calls are innocent and simply cold calling from businesses that are attempting an easy and inexpensive way to entice you to provide them with information that they can use to contact you, target you, target you with email advertisements or contact details that a salesperson can contact you. However, many such calls are not so innocent. You and only you can protect yourself, your identity and your information. Use the following tactics. Try and verify the caller identity by using small talk and direct questions. Be careful of vendors, contractors, disgruntled employees asking odd questions about business matters. Someone claiming to be someone with authority. A caller refusing to provide a return phone number. The giving of unnecessary compliments or words of admiration. Or somebody claiming they need something urgently, something that simply cannot wait. Someone exhibiting the behaviors as I just mentioned. And also avoids being questioned. Be careful. Some more specific considerations and awareness. Your bank will never ask you for information by telephone if they call you. Be careful if your bank calls you and claim it is the fraud department wanting to verify information. 
If in doubt, call back. However, when you phone your bank, they will ask you questions to confirm your identity. This is normal. Let's look at some SMSs and WhatsApp messages. SMS phishing, also called smishing, is a criminal activity using the conventional SMS platform to deliver open or hidden links to your cell phone. Phishing once again, in simple terms, is the act of someone trying to get your personal or sensitive information such as passwords. Always double check even if you think you know the sender. Many people simply respond without thinking. It could be a fraudster contacting you, pretending to be someone you know. It could be an SMS claiming that the sender is in hospital and wants you to text back. Be careful. Similar to email, sender details can be changed. Most people now have smartphones that can connect to the internet. A malicious link sent via e uh, SMS can in a matter of seconds pass information about you and your phone to an address on the internet. This remote address can then respond and again, within seconds, install a script on your phone and if you do not have the correct protection, you are exposed. Smishing messages may come from telephone numbers that are in a strange or unexpected format. If you have any doubt, delete it immediately. Do not open it and do not click on any links or any highlighted text. Some messages warn that the consumer will be charged unless he cancels his supposed order by going to a website. Don't! Some smishing techniques are insidious and can result in spyware downloaded to your device. Some considerations. Remember, nobody will select your number randomly and send you a gift. Don't get caught. Be very careful of any vendor offering advice by SMS. Unless you are subscribed to them, be very careful and once again, do not click on any link if in doubt. Rather search for the topic in your browser if you are concerned about the advice. Don't respond to a suspicious text. Just delete the message and block the sender. And if a message says you should reply back with stop, don't. If you don't know the sender, please don't click any links or call any numbers provided in the text. Also, never download apps via text messages. Smishing messages may prompt you to download an app to your mobile device via a link provided in the message. This link can be much more you bargain for. The bottom line here. Apps should only be installed from a recognized and trusted app store. Never ever from a link within an SMS. Such links can lead to malicious websites designed to steal your information or get you to download malware onto your device and you won't even know it. If you want to make sure a text message is legitimate, look up the correct contact information for the company or bank in question, then contact them directly to verify that they are the ones who contacted you. Let's look at email. Knowing where to look and what to look for is half the battle. 
Email is the largest single attack target on the planet. To understand all the risks that you and your company faces, you need a solid plan and approach. Without this, you will not be able to defend against the daily threats found in the email. Let's look at some general considerations. Phishing emails may contain threats claiming to shut your account down. Asking you to click on a link to fix your account. Verifying payment information. Be very afraid. They may look sincere and legitimate, but be very, very careful. Look out for words like urgent or words that are misspelled. If you see this, be aware. A reputable business will never ever ask you for sensitive or personal information via email. Make sure that the mail from Peter is in fact the Peter you know. Attachments. Always scan attachments with a good antivirus software program before opening it. Be especially aware of any zipped attachments. Always scan attachments for viruses before opening it. This concludes the lecture on email. I trust you have a better idea and you know what to look out for. If you are still unsure about something specific, post your question in the comments. I hope you have enjoyed the lecture. Keep up the good work and be alert. Hi, good day and welcome to this lecture. Today we're going to talk a bit about the internet. Surfing on the internet. Safely surfing the internet. Protecting ourselves. Avoiding viruses. Avoiding spyware. Everybody does it. It has become one of the most common activities of everyday computer users. Searching, browsing, surfing, finding information, visiting sites, reading, doing research, and the list goes on and on. My main objective of this lecture is to help you stay safe and not to become a victim of spyware and other malicious nice people out there. For those of you that are under the impression that spyware, viruses, malicious downloads, malware, etc. you will only get from shady sites, maybe from adult sites or from illegal download sites, you are in for major shock. Those nasties hide in the most innocent of places. Let me give you a scenario. You open Google or your favorite search engine. You type your search phrase or research topic that you want to get information on. In most cases you will get a long list of results. Many of these could be or could contain something malicious. You just don't know. 
but you have to start somewhere so you click on one of these links and a website opens and without you knowing it you could have just injected spyware onto your computer for those of you that don't know what spyware is you don't see it nothing changes on your computer nothing starts behaving differently just your personal information is shared without you knowing it so what do we do about it how do we prevent it how do we protect ourselves firstly avoid the obvious let me give you an example if you're on the road all day every day the chances of getting involved in an accident is a lot greater than somebody who seldom drives on the road. Similarly, if you frequent adult sites or file sharing sites and social networking sites, the chances of getting exposed to spyware is a lot greater than people who never visit these sites. It's simple mathematics. Now before somebody shoots me, I am not saying that these sites must be outlawed, no. What I am saying is avoid these sites if possible, but if you do visit them, listen to the tips and guidelines I provide. It is for your own safety. So how do we protect ourselves? Firstly, if any of these sites are not secure. Now by not secure, I mean it has not got a small visible padlock or HTTPS in front of the URL. The URL is now the address of the website in question that displays at the top of your browser. If that's the case, please stay away. Especially if these sites offer any files or software or special offers for free. Think about it. Who gives away anything for nothing? They want something. As with the backup software and password managers we've discussed in previous lectures, antivirus and anti-spyware packages are also freely available all over the internet. There are free and paid for versions. In your search engine type something like protection against spyware and you will get a long list of options. One free one to get you started that you can look at is uh, called Total AV. There are many, but if you haven't got something in place, get one. Doesn't matter which one, but get something in place. Just do your homework. If you do currently have antivirus and anti-spyware, Great stuff, but double check that it's not outdated. Make sure it's current, make sure it's a good product with the minimum features that I will recommend right now. The software you need on your computer for safe surfing must co contain at the very least antivirus, anti-spyware and anti-malware protection. That is really the minimum. What you also need is a VPN and it comes included with many antivirus packages. If yours don't have it, get a separate one, but get one. If you don't know what a VPN is, the definition for it is virtual private network. Bottom line, what this software does is it enables you to set up a secure line and a secure connection 
when you connect to the internet. This is critically important when you connect to the internet from a Wi-Fi hotspot or Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi that is provided in coffee shops that is normally not secure. Check when you are in one of these uh, coffee shops and or Wi-Fi hotspots and they, there will normally be a list of Wi-Fi options. It clearly displays which are open and which are secure. If you do not have a VPN installed on your computer that you can activate, do not make use of this free Wi-Fi. Don't take a chance. Some of the hotspots don't allow you to activate and use your VPN. If that is the case, don't use it. That coffee can cost you a lot more than you bargained for. Let us discuss another scenario. When you meet someone on the street or in a coffee shop, what information will you share with this person? You will certainly not share personal information, information about your relationship. Give him your home address or your ID number and maybe even your cell number, not with a stranger, will you? Then why do people share such personal information with strangers on the internet? Be very careful when you visit sites online to find information or when purchasing a product. If a company or website asks for information that has nothing to do with them or nothing really related to your uh, investigation or your information that you need or the product that you want to buy, be aware, be alert. When you purchase something and this website does not redirect you to a secure payment gateway like PayPal, and the site wants uh, all your inf financial information and credit card information directly on the site and it's not a secure site stay away you going to get caught some specifics to protect yourself online Think very carefully before you share information online. Don't post anything on the internet or on Facebook that you don't want other people to see. That is how open the internet and social media is. Carefully read the privacy policy of any website that you post your information on. Make sure that you know what they will do with your information, why they need it, and how the policy enables them to share your information. I've mentioned this before, but on social media, check your security settings and adjust it to what you feel comfortable with. Set it so that only the people you want to see your posts can. Websites that ask you for specific security questions to be able to reset a password. Please do not provide information that actually relates to you and that can be potentially damaging. Provide answers that has meaning to you but not to anyone else and also that cannot identify you in any way or otherwise impact you. Still make sure however that this relates to something you will remember and that you will remember for the purpose that it is asked. It's pointless that you give some secret phrase to the software 
to be able to reset your software and then when the day comes that you need to reset your password and it asks you for that secret phrase th then you've forgotten the phrase then you are double in trouble guard your information keep all your software including web browsers and any apps current with the latest updates where possible set them to update automatically in emails or on websites if there are any pop-ups warnings or other notices that offers a free download a download a free download that claims it will protect your computer or it will scan your computer to find problems what do they really want in return for their free software Obviously it is either a scam or it will let you run the program and then you must pay for the results. Be careful, be alert. Nothing is really free. There is no such thing as a free lunch. Something, somewhere will bite you. Please do your financial transactions at home on your own Wi-Fi or network. At home you can control the environment and you know it is secure. Do not do it in coffee shops or in public places on open networks. It is simply too risky. Do it where you have a VPN available or you know that you are working on a secure network. Never on an open network. If you do have to do a very important transaction, especially if it involves large amounts of money and it has to be done immediately, rather visit your nearest branch and make use of their internet facility. Most banks and institutions provide this free of charge and it is secure. Please follow these tips, precautions and advice that I have provided in this lecture you will be considerably safer than before. I trust you have enjoyed this lecture. Please feel free to comment and update me on your progress. Have an awesome and safe surfing day. See you in the next lecture. children well their father's hell hi good day this is Zach again and welcome to this lecture on internet safety for children today we will discuss the details the facts some methods helping you as parents protect your children online now every parent wants to protect their children in any way possible. Every day you watch out for them. You help your young ones across the street. You try and prevent your teenagers from visiting places or clubs that you find shady. Will they rebel? Of course, obviously, they are teenagers. If they don't challenge your authority, there's something wrong with them or they're lying to you. Teenagers are teenagers and they want to experiment. They want to investigate new things and they want to make their own mistakes. This is normal. But we as parents want to prevent them from making the kind of mistakes that can affect and follow them for the rest of their lives. Trying to protect them when on the internet is no exception. There are the same dangers as in real life. Just a little bit different. A little bit less visible. A lot scarier. What makes this more complex is because they can get onto the internet anywhere and everywhere. We as parents even empower them 
to have access to the internet. We encourage them to have access to the internet because they learn, they communicate, and it helps them with their homework and research. There are so many good things about the internet, but there is also so much bad out there. Take teenagers dating as an example. You as parents can't really control who they date, but you can at least see who they meet. You can at least see who rocks up at the door to pick up your daughter. Online dating for teenagers is of course a total different horror story, and we will get into that soon. In the previous lecture, you learned all about protecting yourself online. Now when dealing with your children and your teenagers, you must apply those same rules. You as the parent must, however, teach your children and especially your younger children and your teenagers to be equally alert and aware online. But this is no easy task. We have to realize and appreciate that children and teenagers are much more naive or trusting is rather is a better word. They don't necessarily see the evils of this world. And that's simply because they have not yet been exposed to it. They are fine they see it on TV and they see it in the movies. But they see this as fiction. They adopt the attitude that it cannot happen to them. That is why they are much more likely to make unwise or reckless choices on the internet. Protecting your children online and making sure that they stay safe. That however cuts through a very very thin line of parental protection parental control and downright interfering in their lives, impacting their privacy. And yes, they are entitled to their privacy, but at the same time it is your duty as a parent to protect them. You should always first give them the benefit of the doubt and respect their privacy. But you should also look out for signs that everything is maybe not so okay. Let's discuss a few of the signs. If your child or teenager turns off his computer the moment you walk into his room, then the first red light should come on. Now once again, this is where that thin line comes in and you as parent needs to make a judgment call. They could have been chatting to a friend, maybe a boyfriend or girlfriend, which can be embarrassment and embarrassing if you found out, especially if they are younger then they still want to hide the boyfriend. They could however have been looking at an inappropriate site. You just don't know. But once again, initially, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt and trust your children. But now you have to monitor this behavior. And if this becomes frequent behavior, then you have to take action. We will discuss this action. If your child starts receiving packages or mail from people you don't know, it's obviously possible that they have ordered stuff online, but it would be wise to inquire what it is 
And if it's a legitimate purchase from my own allowance and not from your bank account, then there's no problem. But it could also be from a potential predator your child met in a chat room. Ask the question. It's your right and duty as a parent to make sure. Now, while you are not supposed to know what's on your teenager's computer, after all, it's their private space and they will very quickly remind you of it. But if it so happens that you do discover inappropriate material, proceed with caution and remember that most of us even those of us before the internet were curious and looked at magazines with inappropriate picture. I'm not saying you did, but some of us certainly did. Discuss this with them. Don't outright ban it, but rather warn them about the related dangers of such sites. And then let them decide for themselves. Spyware and viruses and related dangers are common and frequent on these sites. Explain to them what can happen. Warn them. Now if you notice that your child becomes withdrawn without any specific reason for it, there obviously could be something behind it. Talk to your child. Try to establish if there's anything that bothers them. It could be online bullying. It could also be something like a sex offender that your teenager met through an online dating site. You have to check. You have to try and find out. And if your child doesn't want to open up to you Talk to a family member, let them try. Where you must really try and stand your ground is don't let your child participate in online chat rooms. There are some of them that are innocent, but there are so many people out there that enter into chat rooms pretending to be children or teenagers trying to meet them and then they are very far from being teenagers. We have to be aware of this and we have to alert our children of this. You must teach your children that the username they choose on sites on the internet must not say too much about them. They must use usernames that is as neutral as possible. Let me give you an example. A username of Peter14 that probably indicates that it's a young male of 14 years old. An attractive target. Children must never post any personal information on the internet or on social media, regardless of who asks for it. This is a big, big no-no. Children must also never add friends on social media that they don't actually know, and they must definitely never ever agree to meet somebody that they have met on the internet. So what else can we do as parents? What we need to appreciate is that our teenagers and school aged children are getting so sophisticated with technology that they outpace us. We may have no option but to block or rather limit action 
or to have some insight into what they do online. We need to adopt and use technology to help us manage this problem. Now you need to approach this very, very carefully. Parental control solutions can help to manage this problem. Don't however think that this will be a quick fix. That you can simply install parental control software on your teenager's computer, set up some rules and that's the end of it. Not quite. Many of today's teenagers has many devices. They have cell phones, iPads, some even still have iPods, Playstations and the list goes on and on. Most of these devices give them access to the internet. So what do we do? Yes, we can go ballistic and install parental control software on all their devices, right? Yes, you can, but it's not a good idea. We will get the wrath of our teenagers. They will immediately think we are punishing them. And that's not the intent. The intent is to protect them. We have to apply parental control for the younger ones, especially those that are not yet able to make sensible decisions for themselves. Our teenagers, we have to trust them. Rather than imposing strict parental control, we must teach them and show them the facts of what is right and what is wrong on the internet. That is why it is important that we as parents must be able and enable ourselves by having the knowledge ourselves. Once we have the knowledge, then we can with confidence talk to our teenagers about the issues on the internet. It may even be a good idea to get your teenagers to do the lectures in this course that's related to internet safety. The same ones you have done. Let them see for themselves and enable them to make informed decisions. You must protect the younger ones and put parental control and router limits in place for them. It is the right thing to do. Then the teenagers, once again, empower them with the knowledge and awareness that you have learned. Then it's up to them. They need to be responsible for what they do on the internet. As a tip, the latest versions of Mac OS and Windows have got some parental control software built in. You can also acquire other parental control software with more features and flexibility. One such example is NetNanny. But some specific tips for you. And once again, this is mostly aimed at younger children. Put a password on the computer that you have to log them in to use the internet. Another method, with parental control software you can restrict access to the computer to, to a time limit when there is supervision at home. However, this is not going to help you much if you have many different devices in the household then parental control software is not practical. But your Wi-Fi router also have features and you can then set up and configure your Wi-Fi router with specific times and access times to when a parent is at home. In that way no device can access the internet 
when you or an adult is not present. Appreciate the fact that children are children. Unless you manage what they do, they will hide what they do. Don't think that you can just check their browser history and that this will help you. Ah, ah. They learn quickly how to delete it. Bottom line. As in my lecture about being safe online, teach them not to use file sharing programs and not to illegally download music. Most of the sites that offer pirate downloads, and remember, it is illegal, may in fact infect the target device. They must be careful on social network sites. The younger children with smartphones expand the parental control software to work on these mobile phones as well. It is important, however, that you tell your children and your teenagers that you are implementing these measures and that they understand that it's for their own protection and it's not to punish them or for you to spy on them. You must convince them that it is not about trust but for their protection. And it's up to you as a parent to make sure that they understand this. If they don't understand this, then they will simply do it behind the scenes. Once again, software filters, parental control systems, time locks, any other control methods. All of these can help, but ultimately you need to teach your children about exactly what can go wrong. This is a much better approach than trying to control something that they would be prone to do due to the very nature of children and teenagers being inquisitive and have that yearning to learn and experiment. Have family meetings, talk to them, show them. Let them also listen to this lecture. I trust this lecture has given you some insight into what can go wrong and how to deal with it. And I hope you have some direction how to approach the problem. Make your children aware. Help them understand that it's for their own good. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. Have a good day. Good day and welcome. Today we're going to do some traveling. And we all like traveling. Some of us are regular business travelers, while others are simply traveling for pleasure. It could be a honeymoon. It could be just a holiday. Mind you, going abroad is not just a holiday. You also have your serious adventure seekers. Thousands of people travel on a daily basis. Now, traveling in your own country or abroad creates it, its own unique range of security issues, both personal and for your cyber security. Now, before we go anywhere, did you make your backups? I sincerely hope you did. Regular business travelers are even worse off. 
since traveling for business, they are always on their way to meetings or on the way back from seminars. In most cases, they will have sensitive business information with them. They might not only be the target of the normal cyber criminals, but criminals that are in fact targeting them for that information. Now you have learned how to protect yourself under normal circumstances. Now learn what else you should be on the lookout for when you are traveling. In this lecture I will help you to be just a little bit safer in your personal capacity or your tech stuff. Let us discuss a few Im important topics that you need to address before you leave on your trip. Now for the purposes of this lecture I'm going to assume that you have your passports and visas in place, that you've purchased all your travel goodies, pillows, etc. I'm also going to ignore the general items that your travel agent is supposed to have on their list. I am going to focus on the topics that are not always thought of. Ask your travel agent for emergency information, contact details, physical addresses, etc. of each city you will visit. This must include information like the embassy, police, hotel, at the very least. If you will be visiting a foreign country where it will be difficult to communicate, I strongly recommend that you invest in a language translator program for your mobile or a dedicated translator device to help you with general communication when you visit such countries. Get travel insurance. Many people do, many people don't. It's a personal choice. But I have found that it gives you that little bit of security and a comfort feeling. It's wise and may help you when you least expect it and need it the most. Those going on holiday are excited and they're on a bit of a high. A natural high, not the other kind. You are eager to share your destination and make your friends and families jealous and that's fine. It's nice and good to share, but don't overshare and don't share with the wrong people. Don't make it public. Don't splash it all over social media. That is not so wise. You could easily end up informing the wrong kind of person with basically a road map of where you are going. At the same time, you are advertising that you're not at home and that your home is now probably vulnerable. Now about your tech stuff. Most smartphones, laptops and tablets have security settings that allow you to lock the device with a PIN number or a fingerprint ID. Do this or enable this on each device you take with you. And it's a good idea even when you're at home. If it's a laptop, make sure that you activate the startup password for it. This is especially important at the airport where your dev devices are very vulnerable and are targeted by thieves. If it is password protected, then automatically there's some defense against the security or data breach. Disable your Bluetooth. Don't let your PC get away from you. Bluetooth connectivity can be intercepted. Hackers can potentially hack into your device. Keep Bluetooth off when traveling abroad and only switch it on when you really have to. At the airport, you know, I think 
criminals probably attend a special school that's what it looks like to me sometimes anyway it's almost as if they are trained to spot tourists and can distinguish the non-regular from the regular travelers don't help them by wearing clothes that are screaming tourists Tourists are the first to be targeted by scammers and thieves. Don't get noticed for the wrong reasons. You have to be even more vigilant and alert when you are lounging around the airports. Protect your smartphones, laptops and whatever else you have with you. Wearing the wrong clothing can also get you into trouble when traveling in countries where the appropriate dress is very important. In some countries, it's a sign of respect. Keep that in mind. Be cautious when using public Wi-Fi. It is even more important when traveling than at home. At home, you have many more options than abroad. When using Wi-Fi hotspots, Remember that the same rules and the same security measures that you have learned so far applies. It is even more important to use your VPN. And if you can't, don't do any form of financial transactions. But if at all possible, avoid using open Wi-Fi. Rather go for secured Wi-Fi and ask for the Wi-Fi password. Never connect to a totally open Wi-Fi hotspot. Disable location sharing. Only enable location sharing if there's a specific reason for you to do so. Don't leave it on by default. It could provide easy access to the wrong person. Be aware that if a wrong person can track your movements, they know each time you are not in your hotel room. Now when you reach your destination, now I'm not saying go to the first pub you see, but a pub is certainly one of the best places to speak to locals. Otherwise, the front desk of the hotel or guest house is also a good place to get information. Be polite and friendly, but ask the locals or receptionist for relevant information and make notes, keep them handy. Ask which parts of the city you should avoid. Ask them to get an idea of how much a taxi should cost where good but inexpensive restaurants are. Don't however get into such a discussion that you start oversharing. Don't share your travel plans, accommodation or personal information. Be safe, be alert. I trust you've enjoyed this lecture. Happy travels.